Well, hi everyone. I am back again with Dr. Mansour Muhammad, who is one of my favorite teachers and functional genomic scientists in the world, but he is the number one in the world. And we've just had a very, very fascinating conversation um, about uh, uh, genes and allopathic medicine and functional medicine. But the topic for today's uh, episode is going to, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to go through uh, my own gene report. So Dr. Mansour, for those who don't know uh, Dr. Mansour, he is from the DNA company. Uh, he is a functional genomic scientist who has been on this podcast already twice before. This is the first time in the history of Pushing the Limits that we've had someone on three times, and I honestly could have Dr. Mansour on every week. Um, welcome to the show, Dr. Mansour. It's an absolute privilege to have you back again. And today we're going to go over my report um, and share uh, with the world what it is that the DNA company does, what functional genomics is about, and then actually go over some of my genes and what they imply for my life and for my uh, health moving forward and what I need to be aware of. So Dr. Mansour, welcome to the show. It's such an absolute honor, Lisa. Um, for the audience out there, please forgive me if my throat is just a little bit toned down. <laughs> I do this and I, I'm with patients pretty much on the hour, every hour. Disclaimer number one, disclaimer number two. Lisa, is there any bleed through of background noise that is coming through the microphone? No, we're all good. Because with our stay-at-home orders that are still in different degrees of implementation, um, we're having some work done at my home. We're still working from my home office, and there's only so much I can do to keep on. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. So please forgive me. For the audience out there, you should... Obviously, you're Lisa's audience. You know that she's a force, that is, the world has been blessed with her to do what she does. So really, it's just my honor that she would even deem to ask me to come back. And what we're going to do is we're going to have some fun at the expense of Lisa today. Yes. So you, <laughs> you've obviously gotten to know her through listening to her amazing podcast, her life journey, and seeing her as a perform performance elite person, and then the person behind that performer. But now you're going to see something, and what we're going to do today is, at least per the time that we've given, find a few of the jewels that's behind behind the performer, i.e. Lisa's genomic makeup. And what we will do is we will deconstruct the date, some of the data mm -hmm. that comprises Lisa's genomic makeup and look at how we go about interpreting that in functional genomics and, 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 and I'll describe and I will I will define some of these things here shortly. That's, okay, That sounds brilliant. So just to give the, uh, the listeners a bit of background, the DNA company based in Canada, run and, and, and founded by Dr. Mansour, has a, a hormone reports and a, a whole genome report that looks at uh, a set of the genes that are really um, genes that we can do something about. Would that be a good way of putting it, Dr. Mansour? Because we have 23,000 genes in our makeup, yeah. roughly. So as, as, so first and foremost, what is the, the, the DNA company, we, we take our IP, we take our unique way of looking at the genome of the human being. And what is that unique way? The core of what we do differently, Lisa, is simply this. The core is when you understand that a person's DNA, DNA being the codification system for our genes, genes being the instructions that you know, take care of the multitude of functions that the cells need to perform to keep us thriving, that DNA is a language in and of itself. It really is. And so unfortunately, thus far in genetics, and this to the audience is when Lisa hinted earlier of the lively conversation we were having prior to coming online that about allopathic medicine is, in genetics, much like other parts of medicine, we take a very siloed approach to things. Mm -hmm. So in genetics, what you'll tend to find is if you look at the vast majority of genetic reports or simply even the philosophy of genetics out there is, here's a gene, here's its job, here is a variation in that gene, and then let's document what that might mean. And then there are a hundred others, a thousand others, and as Lisa's pointed out, there are 23,000 odd genes in the human genetic makeup. Now, if you were to do that, what you're doing, per the analogy of what I started with, is this would be like studying the vocabulary of a language. 
In other words, a language. Definitely one of the things that makes a person an expert, makes a person fluent in a language, is the vocabulary. The more words you know, mm -hmm. that's what will help you in understanding a language. Good. However, a language is much more than just vocabulary. A language is about grammar. It's about how sentences are structured. If you really want to be fluent in a language, you have to understand how to frame the discussion and how to frame the discussion as in how do we take genes in cascades and understand them. So at the DNA company, what we do differently is we look at genetics through the lenses of functional, cellular, biochemical cascades and pathways, because that's how the human body works. In other words, what you start with is you start with the human being. You start with the person in front of you. You look at their biologic principles, their processes. You dive deeper. You go to the cellular level. You ask, what are the cascades, the biochemical cascades that are needed? Then you ask, what are the genes that contribute to that, those cascades? Then you ask, what are the variations in those genes mm -hmm. that might then, uh, the permutations and combinations of how those genes work together mm -hmm. that might make that cascade more or less optimal? This is functionality. Only when you understand genes in their cohesive, connective language-based system, can you really interpret genetics intent intelligently? And what we're going to see here with Lisa today is I'm going to give you a few of these dual insights, taking Lisa's genes individually, but show how they connect together to tell stories about Lisa behind the scenes, cellular Lisa, cellular Lisa Tomati. We're going to see how are things working in her, when are they optimal? When are they less optimal? When are they less optimal in particular nutritional, environmental, lifestyle decisions? So then intelligently, if we know that this is what is happening in Lisa's body, we can say, here's how we can go in to improve the outcome that if left alone might not be as desirable as we want it to be. That's what we do differently, Lisa. Yeah, and very that, that is so succinctly put. So it's it's looking at pathways and whole. What is it's not just taking one gene and saying, well, this is suboptimal, therefore you have this. But it's looking at combinations of genes that are on different parts of the genome, even which I found fascinating. It's not all you know, just the methylation works and looks at the methylation, but it can affect the hormones. It can affect the the other parts of it so this is going to be a really fascinating and i'm really bearing my soul here people like this is my genes <laughs> but i want to share this information because i want you to understand why understanding and knowing your genes will be powerful for a, a preventative approach to your health and looking after your health and your longevity so a lot of people think dr mansell just before we go in that genes if i know my genes that's fatalistic if i've got the the BRCA gene Therefore, I'm going to get breast cancer. And that is not the approach that you take or that I understand to be correct, is it? It's Absolutely. not fatalistic. Absolutely, it is not to be fa In fact, it is everything but being fatalistic. In fact, it is an understanding, and we could go down, we can do a whole podcast on the BRCA gene. I spoke two years ago um, at the cancer awareness, it's this, you know, it's an awareness fundraiser. It's the who's who in Canada that show up at this big event. And I was the speaker two years ago and I asked the audience, I said, everyone in the audience, this is how I started my talk. I said, everyone in the audience that is familiar with the BRCA2 gene, put their hands up. And everyone, as you might imagine, at the mm -hmm. breast cancer awareness yep. Yep. event, put yep. their yes. hands up. Then I said, everyone in the audience that's familiar with this CYP1B1 gene, put their hands up. And one young woman who had happened to do the test with us, <laughs> and she put her hands up. And I said, this represents the travesty of one subset of medicine, i.e. individuals that are involved in the breast cancer world, both at the patient and the clinical level, that all of you should know the BRCA, about the BRCA gene, but that one of you in an audience of almost 500 people yeah. should have heard of the CYP1B1. So it is not to be fatalistic. Uh, Lisa, not in the least. It is to be empowering. It's yeah. to 
allow individuals to better appreciate here is my operating manual and, and we're going to get into this now and i would just say to your audience you know lisa many times including even internally sometimes you know companies obviously we have to do things we have to stay relevant and we have to stay financed and so on and so forth and so even i have times where I have to battle with people telling me, Mansur, you know, the average consumer has a grade eight or grade seven uh, ability to read. So <laughs> we've got to, you know, we've got to dumb it down a bit. Okay? Yeah. Here's my response to this, Lisa, and to all of your amazing audience members. I ask one question. Mind you, the world has changed somewhat since COVID. So yep. this question and analogy might be slightly, but here's the point. The last time you planned for a beautiful vacation, a trip, or the last time you planned to replace that car and you're going to now buy a new car, how much time did you take researching that destination, researching what currency is needed, the safety of the place you're going to, the cultural norms of the place that you're, how much time and effort did you a huge put amount. Learning about that thing, learning about a microwave, for heaven's sakes, before you were buying it, or the latest, greatest vacuum cleaner. <laughs> How much time do we take as individuals learning about ourselves, learning about how our bodies work? Zero. We all, exactly. And why is this the case? Because we have somehow been either willfully or not brainwashed into thinking well, you know, at the end of the day, if, if someone keeps telling you, you know what, the human body is too complex for you to ever understand it. Don't even bother try. Exactly. Then at some point in time, you kind of go, well, I guess, you know, I'll never yeah, understand. Yeah. So, so this is the thing that we've got to break, Lisa. We've got to, first and foremost, get rid of this outdated uh, elitist perspective that the human body can only be understood if you've got a... Uh, some sort of that yeah. Granted, we're not all going to be neurologists, so we're not going to all be anesthesiologists or whatever. Absolutely. But if you appreciated how much of, the, of yourself that you could better understand, that you could actionalize, that will make you feel empowered of taking health steps for you and your family members, good God, yeah. we could dramatically improve the health of our, health of our societies yep. if we would do this. Yes. And, and, and that's why I think the people that are listening to this, I'm probably, probably preaching to them converted um, because, you know, I don't have a medical background and yet in the story with my mum, as people will know, um, the medical professionals were at an end of their abilities to help her and we were told there was no coming back. Well, you know, four years later, as you can see, my mum is completely normal again because I did not accept. And what I want people to take away from that story is to take ownership to within your ability to be uh, proactive and not give up your control to any one person, to anyone. You don't have to just give up your control of your own health to your local doctor or to any one person at all. You know, do your own research. By all means, go to your doctor, get the information, and then go and do your research. And that's all we're asking, really. Uh, and the gene tests help us to understand on a level that is really, really fundamental um, some of these processes. Absolutely. So, Lisa, here's what we're going to do. So, and for the audience, we're, we're clearly not going to go through all of the amazing things that make up Lisa to be that amazing person. But like she said, she's bearing her soul. She's bearing her DNA. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick a few of the pathways, not just genes, show you, A, as it applies to Lisa. But more importantly, the reason Lisa is doing this is to show you, the listener, the equal of this, i.e. your genetic understanding, what it may mean for you. Now, Lisa... I don't think we could have something more time appropriate as to the concerns of our current, you know, dealing with the COVID pandemic. And so here is something as a human being, the human body is challenged constantly, not just with the current virus, not just with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. We're constantly challenged with viruses and microbia that are part of the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. Okay. But one of the most important bodily responses, obviously, to a microbial infection is the antimicrobial 
capacity of the human body. Now, when you think of the antimicrobial capacity of the human body, most of us, to the degree that we're relatively familiar with, you know, human body physiology, we think of antibiotics, isn't it? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, sorry, we think of antibodies, uh, the, the immune system's antibodies. And mm -hmm. of course, from a treatment perspective, we think of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. and the reason I made that Freudian slip is, of course, we've got Dr. Alexander Fleming, uh, uh, given the, the mantle of discovering antibiotics. But that same Dr. Fleming, before he discovered antibiotics, had discovered something that he felt was even more remarkable but because it was not patentable and because he couldn't and the powers to be could not figure out how to commercialize it, it got, it got lost in the wayside. Mm -hmm. What did he discover? He discovered something called antimicrobial peptides. Oh. AMPs. Antimicrobial peptides. Antimicrobial peptides, to date, there are now, we, we, we now understand there are dozens of our genes, so still a small subset of the 20 plus thousand genes, but as a whole, dozens, if not well over a hundred genes in our operating manual. What do these genes do? They encode these peptides, short sequences of amino acids, in other mm -hmm. words, small proteins, and these peptides have profound antimicrobial properties, and they're distinct from your antibodies. They're distinct wow. from the immunoglobulins, the IgGs, IgAs, IgMs, IgEs to a lesser degree that are produced by your B cells. They're completely distinct from that, and actually, these AMPs, antimicrobial peptides, which we have, again, dozens of our genes making different antimicrobial peptides, wow. form one of the first order defense mechanisms against microbial infections, including viruses, bacteria, wow. and other microbia. Okay, uh -huh. so uh -huh. when we are exposed as human beings to microbial agents, one of the very first things our body has to do while it is making its B cell immunoglobulin response is that it expresses these AMP genes that act as a first line defense to microbial infections. Why wow. is this important? And what does it have to do with genetics? Well, it has to do with your vitamin D. So now we've introduced these AMPs by the way, audience, this is functional medicine and functional genomics, understanding the parts of the picture and putting it together. So now we switch gears from AMPs, this critical part of your immune system, to vitamin D. Many of us think of vitamin D as this micronutrient, right? Did you think of there is vitamin C, an antioxidant, there is vitamin A, there is vit the vitamin Bs, and so on and so forth. And in that list of what we call the alphabet vitamins, we've got vitamin D. Nothing can be further from the truth. Wow. Vitamin D is a hormone. Uh -huh. So first, of, and what is the yeah. definition of the hormone? Something that is produced in one part of the body, exactly. but then it packs and signals the rest of the body. So mm -hmm. it's, it's produced in one discrete place, yet it has ramifications throughout the body. Mm -hmm. Well, vitamin D is produced in the dermal layer, secondary to UVB's induction, mm -hmm. goes to the liver, it gets modified, it becomes activated, and then it impacts the body. How does vitamin D, just one, if the audience walks away with just one thing from today, let them walk away with questioning themselves. How does vitamin D, when you take that all, you know, important, cheap vitamin D supplement or you go in the sun, how does vitamin D do what it does in the human body? Mm -hmm. Let's repeat this, Lisa. Vitamin D is a, transcri a gene transcriptional regulator. Wow. What does vitamin D do? Like literally, is vitamin D involved in a, in a building process within your cells? No. Vitamin D enters into our cells by binding a receptor. Mm -hmm. So our cells of our body, there are vitamin D receptors. The vitamin D from the bloodstream, of course, that means the vitamin D was there in the bloodstream in the first place. Yep. 
binds to the receptors in our cells, yep. enters into our cells, and that vitamin D receptor complex enters our nucleus. Mm -hmm. the nucleus where our genes are housed. And what does it then do? It turns on and off genes. And over a thousand when, genes. When, you're, when your cells are bathed in vitamin D, their gene expression signature, which genes are turned on, which genes are turned off, changes. Now, Let's come back to those dozens of genes that encoded these antimicrobial peptides. Guess what turns on those genes? Uh -huh, vitamin D. D. Wow. Vitamin D, when present at optimal levels, and that's the point, it has to be present at optimal levels, is needed for your body's literally first, most important first line defense against wow. microbial insults, it's vitamin D. The vitamin D was needed so that your body can respond through the expression of these amps to the infection. Okay, fair enough. Wow, before so, the immune system kicks absolutely, in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Huh. And by the way, it attacks the immune system as well in, in multifarious ways, but just so discreetly as an a priori system that we don't talk about anymore because unfortunately it could not be patented and benefited. <laughs> yes. Whatever. We seem to have forgotten about this. Now let's put these two things together. Of the, 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 the obvious ramifications of these two systems coming together should be clear to the audience. Now let's talk genetics. Okay, so very, very quickly, here's what happens with the story of vitamin D. Very quickly, you get exposed to the sunlight. The UVB, in, in this regard, we're somewhat like plants. It's an actual photosynthetic reaction. Mm -hmm. UVB stimulates an enzymatic reaction that produces this vitamin D precursor. Mm -hmm. okay? That precursor is taken to the liver from the dermal cells. And in the liver, that precursor is activated. And it is activated into the 125-dihydroxycalciferol, which is your activated vitamin D. D3. Is it D3? Yeah. Actually, that's a common misconception. Uh -huh. D3 is the precursor. D3 is between the original precursor produced in the dermal cells, but D3 is not 125 dihydroxy. Okay. One, uh, it's what we'd call the, the, the 25 hydroxycalciferol, and then the 125 dihydroxycalciferol okay. is the downstream modification of D3. Okay. Okay. Now, one gene, CYP2R1, CYP of that massive, important CYP450, CYP450 mega family of genes. What do the cytochrome P450 genes, it's this huge family, CYP2R1, CYP1A2, CYP1A1, CYP3A4, and so on and so forth. It's a mega family of genes. These genes encode enzymes. These enzymes are, in essence, responsible for your phase one metabolism. Mm -hmm. So anything that the body needs to biotransform A into B, that's what these cytochrome P450s do. They are massively involved in the metabolism of the medications that we take, which wow. is why we have the whole field of pharmacogenomics, for example. Now, specifically, CYP2RIVOR1, CYP2R1, this is the member of the family that makes its self-named enzyme, CYP2R1 enzyme. And what's the job of this enzyme? Well, amongst other things, this enzyme exclusively activates and converts the vitamin D precursor into the 25 and then 125 dihydroxycalciferol. Okay, now here is functional genomics at its best. Let's quickly complete the story, then we get to Lisa's results. After the activated 125-hydroxycalciferol, we'll just call it from here on forth vitamin D, okay? Once the vitamin D is made in the liver, 
it needs to get into the bloodstream because of course you don't want all your vitamin D just in the liver. It needs to get into the bloodstream, be circulated into the body. Why? Because we want it binding those receptors, entering our cells and doing all of the wonderful things that it will do from a gene, gene expression perspective once it gets into our cells. Okay, well, we've run into a little snag there biologically because it turns out that vitamin D is fat soluble. And the blood is water-based. Water -based. Mm. How do you transport a fat-soluble thing in a water-based medium? Well, the body f that was a problem, and the body has an ingenious way of figuring that out. The body produces this, this, this transporting calyx, this mm -hmm. taxi cab yep. that will encapture the vitamin D that otherwise wouldn't be dissolvable in the blood to allow it to be transported. And this is known as the VDBP, vitamin D binding protein. Mm -hmm. Well, that is the product of a gene in and of itself. There's a gene, the VDBP gene, that makes the vitamin D binding protein that is the taxi cab of the vitamin D, check mark. Then the vitamin D being carried by the taxi cab gets to the cells. It does not enter the cells just by diffusion. It enters the cells by binding to that receptor that specific receptor, allowing it to be engulfed into the cell and going and doing its gene transcription job. The vitamin D receptor is the product of yet another gene, the oh. vitamin D receptor gene. Uh -huh. Okay, so here we've got, we've got the CYP2R1 gene that is activating and making the vitamin D. We've got the VDBP that will then take the vitamin D and transport it. We've got the VDR that then becomes the receptor to allow the vitamin D to be entered into the cells. Okay. This is functional genomics because here it goes. Many reports are out there that would look at the CYP2R1 gene, the gene that's making vitamin D and go, here is the gene that determines if you have healthy levels of vitamin D. <laughs> It's only the first point Part of the puzzle. Yeah. And nothing, it turns out, not, you know, serendipitously, Lisa and I, we didn't construct this. This is actually her results. Lisa has the optimal version of the CYP2R1 gene, meaning Lisa's gene that encodes the enzyme, that enzyme that activates the vitamin D, she's got a high efficiency version of that enzyme. So were we to do one of these superficial gene reports, we would say Lisa's got genetic equivalence of optimal vitamin D. That's what we would say. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Now you understand the story could not have been so premature. She does have the gene that activates vitamin D kinetically, catalytically, optimally. But now let's finish her story. You see, because that vitamin D isn't going anywhere anytime fast in the bloodstream unless it can be picked up by that taxi cab. Wow. Lisa's got a two-seater tuk-tuk for a taxi cab. <laughs> so I can't transport my vitamin D to the actual receptors, even not though I'm making it. Not very well. Not very well your vitamin D binding proteins binding capacity. And what does vitamin D binding protein bind to? Vitamin D. And so your vitamin D binding protein, its affinity, its taxi cab passenger pickup capacity is very, very low. In right. fact, you have the lowest vitamin D binding capacity. Wow. Genetic. Wow. Then when your vitamin D which of course you've just got these two seater tactics driving around taking the vitamin D as opposed to a nice oh, break on them, picking yep. up loads of them and dropping them off. Once they get to your receptor, remember that the vitamin D isn't going to enter your cells through, you know, endocytosis or just by diffusion. It has to enter the cell through this very controlled lock and key receptor model. Uh -huh. Why? do you want vitamin D to be so controlled? Because as much as we love it, once vitamin D enters the cell, it's going to cause some profound gene expression changes. Right. So you want something that can do that to your gene expression to just be getting in and out of the cell willy-nilly. So it has to go through the receptor. Well, then we hit another snafu with Lisa. You see, Lisa has a low affinity receptor. Oh, so I've got double whammy. So 
yes, Lisa has the ability to activate and make her vitamin D catalytically efficiently, but frankly, thereafter, she's not transporting it very efficiently, nor is she absorbing it into the cells very efficiently, relatively speaking, obviously. Mm -hmm. And vitamin D will do you no good floating around your bloodstream. Wow. Because you can deliver. In, in, in order for vitamin D to do what it needs to do, it's got to get into your cells. And hence tying it back to the current exposure and that we're dealing as a humanity, as a race, with you know, this new virus that has showed up on the scene and we'll have many more of these to deal with in the generations and years to come with. If we are to fight at that first primordial level with our antimicrobial peptides, these genes that need to be turned on, and the thing that is turning on these genes is vitamin D, but in order to do so, the vitamin D has to get into your cell and get into your nucleus. You can understand here, audience and Lisa, if you just did a superficial report and said, oh, look, your CYP2R1 is efficient, yeah. Lisa's happy, she makes vitamin D very efficiently, without that holistic understanding of really what's going on, we would have missed a hugely important perspective that Lisa actually is at risk for not A, transporting, B, absorbing the vitamin D, which is really ultimately what you need to have happen. Is that clear, Lisa? Yeah. So if I, uh, but if I take a vitamin D supplement, then I'm not, I'm still going to have the same problem, aren't I? So, so now here comes the biohack and you've just nailed it. You see, and Lisa, have you ever from time to time tested your vitamin D levels and, and, and what do they tend to come back as? No, I haven't. I've never done that. This no. Is something you need. So this is what, so now did you understand? And of course mm -hmm. you're in New Zealand and it's got, you know, it's still in my bucket list. And in fact, Lisa and I were over all <laughs> for me to visit and then COVID. And then COVID came. <laughs> God willing, one day I'll still have a chance to come visit Lisa and your awesome, awesome country. Yeah, uh, for sure. Fair enough. See, Lisa, so now that you know what you know, it will do you no good to be one of those individuals that does this mega dose vitamin D wow. once every three weeks or once every, you know, that some people, well, I went to the doctor and I yeah. got my mega dose. Because what did that mega dose do to you or do for you? Okay. Nothing good. <laughs> because your body, A, in order for vitamin D to be stored in your body, by the way, okay, it has to at least, and what you're taking is D3, which still needs to go to the liver, which still needs to be activated, which then needs to leave the liver, and at least in when the vitamin D gets to adipose cells, the fatty cells, then when those cells absorb the vitamin D, they can be stabilized. Hence the term vitamin D being fat soluble. Mm -hmm. But now that we know Lisa has what she has, in order to play to the better tune of Lisa's body, i.e. to play to the tune of her genetics, what is far more advisable for Lisa? Far more advisable is, let's just assume, let's just assume that we can tell someone you should take 5,000 IUs of vitamin D daily. And the average person says, okay, and so they take 5,000 for a thing in the morning or whenever they do. With Lisa, what you need to do is you need to take your vitamin D on a much more circadian dosing regimen that wow. you take a little bit in the morning, a little bit at lunchtime, a little bit in the early afternoon, so that you are playing to the limited capacity that your body has to transport and absorb. Wow. This circadian benefit that your body is designed based on your noble beautiful heritage and ethnicity you are better designed to be the person who is getting a more consistent daily exposure of sun where yep. you get your morning sun your midday sun your afternoon sun does that, does that occur? yeah absolutely that so i've been having mine all in the morning and then and that won't be doing cutting the mustard so to speak you, you're only benefiting, benefiting from a fraction of what you're taking, to yep. be truthful. Wow. For you to better benefit, and we see this, we measure hundreds and hundreds of patients that fall into the category that you fall into, and by t certainly they need to take it, and certainly you taking what you've been taking in the morning is better than not. However, these individuals still often struggle to optimize yeah. both their blood 
examples, as well as simply how they're feeling, and not until we give them the same dose. And here's the point. We give them the same daily dose, but we simply parcel it out from morning, lunchtime, afternoon, dosing regimen, and their levels become better, they feel better, the type of things we're looking for is better in those individuals from a, from a wow. cellular physiology perspective. So this, Lisa, is exactly, in its beautiful little nuance, the full story of functional medicine, functional genomics. Functional genomics, understanding that it was not just a single gene, it was the system and understanding that when we enable optimal cellular uptake of vitamin D, we're not just feeding the cell a trivial micronutrient, we're feeding the cell something that will have profound ramifications on gene expression things, such as boosting antimicrobial peptide production, which is why they've always been provocative not just anecdotal, provocative studies that do emphasize that optimizing vitamin D at times of infections is exceedingly important for healthy outcome. But wow. here comes the point. Then you always get that story, and this is the point that if we just ended here, we would have done hopefully a service to your community. You get those studies that go, such and such study could not duplicate the the shortening the duration of the viral infection or reducing the severity of the symptoms yep. with vitamin D dosing. <laughs> the study did not do. The study may have studied 100 people giving them vitamin D and maybe, you know, the, the consistency of the outcome wasn't there, but they did not ask, the was the person, the person like Lisa? Yeah. And in the study, they would have given that person a thousand IUs in the morning, a hundred people, with, and expect that somehow magically, if I give a thousand, a hundred people, a thousand IUs of vitamin D in the morning, they're somehow going to benefit from the thousand IUs equally all in the hundred. And so these are poorly designed clinical is, studies. And so we've got a poorly designed study that did not understand the individuality with which that person was going to benefit from the vitamin D. And then we make this audacious claim, see, vitamin D dosing does not do anything. There's no evidence that suggests that vitamin D helps with the common flu or, the com or anything else. And this Nothing. is why it's important to get your genes tested <laughs> so that you know. Nothing. Wow. And that is just vitamin D. And we've, just, you know, there's, there's a hundred story of <laughs> vitamin D. That's it. Nothing else. <laughs> wow. So that is mind blowing. So now I know what to do. I mean, I've been taking my vitamin D, uh, 2000 IUs in the morning, but now I probably need to take probably 5,000 over the course of the day, but not too late at night because you don't want to have that at night. And one of the reasons is now you understand if vitamin D enters your cells, turns on, turns off genes. Guess what some of the genes that it's turning on? They're circadian rhythm genes. Mm -hmm. Vitamin D, which in a normal setting we're making naturally by being in the sun, has been designed as one of the gene transcribing signals that helps the body to understand when is it daylight, when is it nighttime. So if we took the same 5,000, here are three different dosing schedules, 5,000 IUs in the morning or versus 5,000 IUs 9 p.m. at night or versus a couple thousand in the morning, a couple thousand at lunchtime, and maybe a final thousand at 3 to 4 p.m., nothing later than that. The impact on the body can be vastly different. Wow. different. First, to begin with, based on your individual genetics. Secondly, taking 5,000 in the evening, to whatever extent you did absorb, you just told your body at 9 p.m., wake, wake up, it's morning, <laughs> it's sunlight. You just did. <laughs> wow, that is mind-blowing. That is really fascinating. So don't take your vitamin D late at night if you want to sleep, because you've just told your body it's the morning, because that's when the sunshine comes out. And we are, you know, ancient beings that have you know, mucked up our circadian rhythms by being in 
indoors and, and, and light and so on, but that's a topic for another day. Okay, so that's the story of vitamin B and my uh, for vitamin D. In my case, I've got a poor transporter and a poor receptor. Now, that's because there's lots of uh, other ones that I wanted to cover. So now let's shift gears here. But the reason I start with vitamin D, A, just as an FYI, because of the... Because of COVID. Of, of COVID. Yeah. But what was another finding, Lisa, with the COVID? What, was, what started to open the eyes to the clinical community that COVID was a, was a beast of a tad different color when it came to viral infections, i.e. when it came to coronavirus? Super, yeah, super contagious. The, the profound vascular role, the, 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 the comorbidities of vasculature physiology. Yes. Yep. So that we early on we recognized that hold on, as with many other viruses, the impact of these viruses clearly was not the same. You know, you've got a virus, everyone that gets a particular virus A gets ill, certain physiologies, and then they go through the course of the illness, and then there are different degrees of you know outcome. With this coronavirus, as many other coronaviruses there was a clearly wide spectrum of physiologic outcomes and course of diseases from obviously everything that is exceedingly mild so that there are you know, individuals who go, oh, this is not very serious, mm -hmm. to everything that is deathly. Well, one of the comorbidities that was helping us triage that community is individuals that have certain risks of pre-existing vascular health concerns. Well, it turns out that one of the important cofactors here is the sensitivity and the health of the, what is called the glycocalyx of the blood vessels. What is the glycocalyx of the blood vessels? The, think of your glycocalyx as the Teflon coating on the inner lining of your blood vessels. You see, every living, break, we, every living breathing, waking, sleeping moment of life, Blood is swooshing past the inner lining of our blood vessels, number one. So there is sheer stress on the inner lining of our blood vessels. If you took, and we all know these experiments, if you took the hardest marble or concrete or granite and you just took a drop of water and it just drip, 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 over time, it can have quite the wear and tear yeah. on a surface. Yeah. Likewise, and at, a, and at an even accelerated level, if you've got some liquid swishing past, this is called the shear stress, yeah. so shear force, so that our blood, depending on other parameters of blood pressure and so on and so forth, it's swishing past the inner lining of our blood vessel. And the health and the resilience of the inner lining of the blood vessel is extremely important in dictating longitudinal vascular health. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the key components and findings of the coronavirus, this particular one, the SARS-CoV-2, is when what one of the places it can infect, i.e. one of the places where there are these ACE2 receptors, is the lining of the blood vessels. Uh -huh. Now, why did we start with vitamin D? Not just because it's this awesome story, but because vitamin D, other than its role in playing, turning on these antimicrobial peptides, vitamin D also plays this massively important role in controlling and tonating the inflammatory response in cells. See, inflammation, mm -hmm. which is, seems like this overly generic term, but it's not. Inflammation is one of the most awesome examples of a cascade. Inflammation is an example of an avalanche that once it gets going, we either trunk, we need it for certain responses, but we want to truncate it early on. Yeah. We do not want inflammation and the factors that lead to and continue inflammation to stay overly long because then we enter into chronic inflammation. Mm -hmm. Vitamin D in its role in turning off and turning on genes plays a radically important job in controlling and limiting 
chronic inflammation. Okay. Now, chronic inflammation becomes one of the key downstream consequences when we have too much shear stress and inflammation at the lining of the blood vessel. Mm -hmm. Viral infections, such as the SARS-CoV-2 virus, what does it cause when it enters a cell? Inflammation. If there are things like hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and so on and so forth, pre-existing in a person, what do we have? We have pre-existing conditions of vascular endothelial inflammation. Yep. If you add on top of that pre-existing vascular inflammation through hypertension, through type 2 diabetes, now you add to that a viral infection that is going to accelerate, add to that inflammation. Now you can start to see why individuals with premorbidities of uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, hypertension, are the ones who have an increased risk of more yep, severe serious. disease. Yep, yep, okay. yep. So now what we've just done there is we've looked again, functional, good physiology, understanding the contributing components. Now let's look at the genetics. You see, at the seat of whether there's going to be inflammation at the lining of the, or the risk of it, is the quality of your Teflon coating. Yeah. So we all have this thing, this Teflon coating that shields, that covers, it's called the glycocalyx, the lining of the blood vessels. Okay. Now, we all know, you know, here, Lisa, I'm not sure in New Zealand, there's this amazing store where if you ever wanted to, you know, if you're a, if you're a foodie in a kitchen aficionado, it's called the Williams Sonoma store. So that's mm -hmm. where you get awesome gadgetry that's where you get the good quality stuff oh wow okay and we all know you know in america we'll say if you got a teflon coated frying pan from william sonoma you would have gotten this really good quality teflon coated frying pan i'm not advocating teflon enough it's just <laughs> yes you can get a same teflon coated frying pan it's teflon coated from the dollar store yeah okay now I've got this dollar store Teflon coated frying pan, this Williams Sonoma Teflon coated frying pan. They're both Teflon coated, but anyone who knows these two stores knows that a month into using the dollar store frying pan, the Teflon has worn off. Yep. It starts sticking and burning the food. Yep. The Williams Sonoma pan continues to be nonstick. Well, a person's genetic makeup dictates or contributes significantly to their glyco vascular glycocalical health. Yep. I.e. genetically contributes. Do you have innately the really good quality Teflon coating or the weaker Teflon coating? Now, to your point at the very start here, Lisa, if you genetically had the weaker Teflon coating, do you throw your hands up and go, well, I've got the weak Teflon coating, can't do anything about it. I'm going to kick the bucket from a stroke or from a heart, from heart disease. The answer is no. No. The answer is, Preventative. cheap cousin bought you the dollar store frying pan for Christmas, because <laughs> it's cheapo, and he still insists on coming over to make sure you're using that gift that he gave you, <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to use the cheaper quality Teflon coated frying pan, but you're going to take some preventative measures. You're not going to use a very harsh scrubbing, you know, brush. Uh, yeah. brush. You're probably going to make sure and use a good non, you know, a good oil, a good cooking oil is the case. You'll do certain things knowing that the quality isn't the best. Yep. Okay. So there are three genetic markers that contributes to a person's Teflon coating quality. Mm -hmm. Three independent markers. These markers are all existing. They all occur in a very special part of your human genome known as the chromosome 9P21 region. It's, it's an actual chapter in your human operating manual. And in that chapter are some of the most important vascular-related genes, of which 
these 9P21 genetic markers are found. The 9P21 genetic markers are so important to vascular health. When they were discovered, this part of the human genome was called the heart of the human genome because wow. it's so important. Oh, nice. There are three of them, three 9P21 markers. We all have them. Each of these three 9P21 markers, we have two copies, one from mom, one from dad. And I've got three of these, so I've got six 9P21 markers that I'm going to look at, six of them. Each of these six markers comes as either an A as an alpha version, G as in George version. So in other words, one human being might have all six A's, zero G's, another person five A's, one G, four A's, two G's, three A's, three G's, and so on and so forth, until you have another human being who has no A's, all G's. Mm -hmm. What this means is we have what is called a six G spectrum. Yep. The more the number of G's a person has, the weaker, the weaker, is that glycocalyx. Yeah. This is the individual that inherited the dollar store Teflon coated frying pan. This is the individual that has to be more mindful about how they're going to treat the surface of their blood vessel. Oh, no. They've got to ensure that their blood pressure, you know, is being moderated appropriately. They've got to ensure that there aren't too many inflammatory things in the bloodstream that would act as abrasions to mm -hmm. the surface. They've got to ensure that their vitamin D levels are optimal wow. so as to ensure that there's controlling inflammation and so on and so forth. Lisa? I, 6G. 6G, oh my gosh, yes. So this is, this is, yeah, when I got this report back, I was like, oh no, that's not a good thing. But instead of being negative about it, what can I do about it? So I can take vitamin D, what else can I do? Well, first, do what you need to do to reduce that sheer stress. Being a 6G and suffering from hypertension is not a good combination. Yeah. So having a 6G, having a surface, having a glycocalyx that is weaker, okay, fair enough, okay? The last thing you want is to have that weaker surface and be constantly abrasing it. Yeah. That's the last thing you want. So let's start from the top. Once we know that a person's a 6G, that person, and of course, Lisa has championed healthy lifestyle living, Lisa's fitness level. I would imagine, Lisa, that your heart rate and your blood pressure is the last of Very things nice. that you have to worry yeah. about. Yeah, okay? Very good. So you just through purposeful, serendipitous, but purposeful lifestyle ambitions and pursuits, you have just gone from, okay, I've got the 6G, but you have taken, you've pulled the rug out from that being a concern for, for you, not entirely as yet, but significantly by ensuring that your blood pressure, your heart rate blood pressure is as good as it can possibly get. Yep. Step number one. Step number two, of the things in the bloodstream, of the things that were they to get into the bloodstream, they would be like that Brillo pad. Yep. They, it would really be inflammatory to the lining of the blood vessel. Well, that's where we get things like toxins, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right? So all of those food preservatives, heavy metals, simply toxins, including, by the way, many, many, many medications. Yes. Many pharmaceutics. We all know. I mean, what's the first thing when a person is put on a statin? When a person is put on a statin, and by the way, this is not about anti-statins. I'm just stating a fact. When a doctor puts a person on a statin, that doctor has to follow up with the liver health of that person. Because we know that over time, by giving a person a statin, we are giving the liver extra, an extra work to detoxify the medication in question, including acetaminophen, Tylenol, you name it, these medications, which are absolutely appropriate when appropriate, but there are examples of things that when they get into the bloodstream, they are they're, they're inflammatory, they're embraced, they're abrasive. Where is it abrasive to? To the lining of the blood vessels. So the yeah. second thing that you can do, Lisa, is 
when you see someone as a 6G, and by the way, my little princess, well, she's not little anymore, she's 18. <laughs> my wife and I are three Gs apiece. So I'm a uh, three G, which is average. Average. Both the blessed individuals are the zero Gs. When you've got a zero G, a person that has all A's, those are the people when they're 80 years old, their blood vessels still look like a 20 year old. And we wow. know that these happen. And doctors have long since puzzled over. And of course, we're asking them, you know, what is your lifestyle? What did you eat? What did you do? And of course, that's important. But those are the zero G individuals. Yeah. Now, my daughter, because my, mom, my wife and I are three Gs a piece, she happened to inherit the three Gs from me, not the A's. And she happened to inherit the three Gs from her mom, not oh, the A's. Just She's like me. Ugly. One of the first things we did, Lisa, and you know, we're blessed, our kids, you know, with our home, they all have this, ensuite bathrooms, you know, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. When they got to an age where they were, you know, to contribute to the home and help with the home and so on and so forth. One of the things they were responsible for was helping to keep their bathrooms, their private bathrooms, tidy. Clean. Yep. And the first thing that we did when we knew that our daughter was a 6G, she's not responsible for using any detergents, any cleaning products. Now, of course, there are healthy alternatives to these things, but just to point out these chemical-based detergents, spray detergents and so on, that you breathe in, these polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the yep. smelling things that you breathe Pinkers, in, yeah. artificial air refreshers and so on and so forth. They, when they enter the body, such as the, why do more smokers, why do more smokers die from cardiovascular disease than lung disease? Of course, you think of smoking, wow. you think of disease. Yeah. More smokers die from vascular events than from lung events. Wow. Okay. Why? Because when the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the benzopyrenes, the, the toxins that are in that cigarette smoke, when it enters from the lung into the bloodstream and it's in the bloodstream, it's extremely chronically abrasive to the lining of the blood vessels. So Lisa, to the second point here, when you're a 6G, what's the other thing that you can do? Notice we're talking about avoidance right now. Right? Yeah, we've avoiding toxins, metals. Right? Avoid toxins, okay? Hugely impactful when you're a 6G. Well, of course, then we can flip it and say, well, what are the things we do do? Well, we, we can do a lot worse than ensuring that we're detoxifying efficiently. So okay. that we are taking the things that help us to detoxify. And, you know, detoxification has become, especially in allopathic circles, and I must admit, we've done an injustice, you know. To the word, yeah. It's either been bandied about as this mm. air theory, you know, what is detox after all? And, and, and in so doing, which sometimes it has really been overly airy fairy, but at the same time, it's a very real phenomena. The yeah. ability to neutralize, metabolize, detoxify things in the body is an absolutely fundamental capacity that the human body has to have. And it involves genes, and it involves what we eat, and it involves cofactors, and it involves vitamin D, and so on and so forth. So Lisa, people that are 6Gs, understanding, doing what it takes for them to do to avoid the sheer abrasion, mm -hmm. avoid the toxins, remove toxins more efficiently are some of the key things you can do to protect your glycocalyx. Yep. Okay. Case point, and I have no affinity with this company. There's a company called, and I can put you in touch with them, Lisa. Artero, uh, please, this is not a, because we have, this is just, just pointing out this mm -hmm. company called Arterosil, A-R-T-E-R-O-S-I-L, Arterosil, mm -hmm. their entire uh, company and clinical trial is based on a compounded set of nutrients that protects the glycocalyx. Oh, wow. And the clinical work has shown that their particular formula, and it's a formula of micronutrients, proprietary to remind you, whatever it is that they do, but I have been very impressed with their clinical trials and what that what that supplemental combination does is it strengthens the teflon it wow. strengthens the 
with glycocalyx. So to your point, Lisa, you you can, you're a 6G. You can't change that. No. You could either have been a 6G that was oblivious to it and not doing anything to have improved your outcome because you were oblivious to it. You could have been a 6G that was pessimistic and go, oh my goodness, I'm a 6G. I'm going to, you know. Yeah. And, 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 and <laughs> a- or you can be a 6G and go, okay, fair enough. I, you know, we're not perfect. We all have our things. We all have our glitches. If this is one of my glitches, I'm going to make sure that this is not one of the glitches that becomes my Achilles heel. Yeah, I'm it kills me. Yeah. So this is the whole thematic, Lisa. And by the way, my point, let's tie what appears to be two completely unrelated things. In fact, three unrelated things. Viral infections, vascular health, vitamin D. And actually, Lisa, that triangulation of the current context of coronaviruses, the health of the vasculature, which is where these 9P uh, markers come in, your vitamin D health, your vitamin D genetics, this triangulation is radically important in determining the triaging of which individuals might be at greater risk were they to get a viral infection for poor outcomes. Yep. Yep, yep. So I would be at a higher risk. You be in this category at a higher risk, but not what you can do to radically change that risk. Yep. So I can, yeah, I can, I can, I can take the right supplements. I can exercise. I can keep my blood pressure low. I can eat a right diet and so on. And this will help me. Now, does this relate to the GST genes as well? Because it does. I've got a poor of those as well. Right. You see, because what did we say was one of the contributing abras- abrasive things? Toxins, isn't it? Yeah, toxic. Yeah. And the degree of toxins in a person's bloodstream is, of course, directly related to their lifestyle choices, their environmental choices. You live in one of the most idyllic countries in the world from that perspective, but still, you know, choices. Mm. But it is also... And, and dietary choices, you know, are we eating foods that are chock full of residual pesticides, chock full of residual, mm. not residual, chock full of preservatives and colorants and additives and so on and so forth. Every bit of that stuff that enters our bloodstream, it just doesn't enter and leave. It enters our bloodstream, has to be bio-neutralized, bio-transformed, usually in the liver, so that it is no longer in the bloodstream causing the havoc that it can otherwise cause. Well, those GST genes, Lisa, which are one of the bodies, they contribute to one of the body's most important detox reactions, glutathione transferases. Mm -hmm. Here is a toxin, here is glutathione. Glutathione is a tri-amino acid peptide. It's just a tiny little peptide. Basically, glutathione is a little tag that when you tag a toxin with glutathione, you biotransform that toxin in a couple of ways. You typically are reducing its toxic properties. Mm-hmm. And you are making it more water soluble. And by so doing, and where is this typically happening in the liver? Yep. And doing that, you have just neutralized the toxin. Yep. You've just made it more water soluble. So it can go through the kidney, through the bladder, out through the urine. Okay. Yep. The GST genes, glutathione transferases, these are the enzymes that show your cells, the liver and other cells, how to tag the glutathione onto the toxin. So how good are you at tagging that glutathione onto that toxin? Why do you want to tag the glutathione onto the toxin? To get rid of it. Neutralize it, yep. And why do you want to neutralize it? Because if you don't, Toxins are abrasive. Toxins are inflammatory causing. Toxins themselves create oxidants. Oxidants damage and inflame cells if they are surplus. Mm-hmm. Cascade, right? So understanding the cascade. Well, it turns out that, and so for the audience, now you can appreciate Lisa being that wellspring of energy and strength and vitality that she represents. Some of it was not coming from her genes. Some of it was coming from her purposefulness and her just doing what she needs to do. Because on this other point, 
You're not going to win any gold medals anytime soon. <laughs> My GST genes aren't great either. So I've got the 9P21, the vitamin D, and the GST ones, not great. So when it Especially comes the P ones. Body, when Lisa's body is thrown the wrench of toxic exposure, her ability to naturally neutralize that toxic exposure is less than average. Therefore, she's at risk for increased infl inflammatory responses. One of the surfaces in the body where that inflammatory response would be particularly telling is the inner lining of her blood vessels. Yeah. Therefore, because her Teflon coating endothelial vascular glycocalyx isn't the healthiest, you know, she's, she's at a higher risk there. And then if she were not in this one aspect, having healthy vitamin D transportation that would have come in and that would have quiesced the system and ensure that that inflammation does not become chronic, ensure that the cascades of cytokine overproduction, which would create these massive inflammatory influx would not happen. That's where that vitamin D and other genes obviously come in. That first part of this cascade here, Lisa's genetics isn't doing her yeah, the best service. No. So Lisa has to now rely, again, not being pessimistic. Here's Lisa, beautiful and healthy, but she's not going to be pessimistic about these genes, but she cannot afford to turn a blind eye no. to the genes either. I can't go smoking and drinking every day of the week. <laughs> I can't be eating fish and chips. I can't be doing those sorts of things that are going to uh, you cause these problems. Threes, you can't be eating a ton of foods that are, you know, or has thrown your omega-6 ratios, which, which can be yes. lead on sixes, but can be overly pro-inflammatory as opposed to the omega-3s. Mm. Lisa can take a look at her diet and Lisa can say, okay, I've got this cheap per Teflon coated frying pan from that adorable cousin that I love, but he's a cheap steak. I'm going <laughs> to use, I have to use it for the rest of my life. How am I going to use that? and plan and make sure it does not stick my food. Everything that I can do to preserve the utility of that. Lisa can approach her diet, her lifestyle, her micronutrients, her supplements, her health parameters to dramatically reduce that. Okay, yes, there's that inherent increased risk, but she can mitigate the most of it by doing things that she can be self-empowered. And that self-empowerment does not mean that she waits until the day comes where she has an aneurysm or stroke event yeah. and then go, give me a medication. That's not what that means. Exactly, exactly. And this is you know, particularly important given you know, my, my parents' history, my father unfortunately passing recently, and my mother also has a six, uh, 6G 9P21. <laughs> so, yeah, so with her, I need to be super, super careful. Um, to, you know, omega 3s, the omega 6 ratio, keeping that in balance, doing the exercises, and all of these types of things. There was a GSTP one. I'm an asthmatic. I've been an asthmatic since I was a little girl. So that, that one there is a, a mediocre, it's a heterozygous, I think, that came through. Actually, you know what, Lisa? Sometimes heterozygotes are the biggest culprits in they? This, the heterozygote we typically are trained we typically think of genes as homozygote optimal yeah like it's suboptimal yes. heterozygote. actually certain genes because of how the gene makes the protein the heterozygote is oh. more delirious wow. the gsp1 many studies indicate that the heterozygote of the GSTP, and we're speaking here of the RS1695 SNP, mm -hmm. which comes in an A allele and a G allele. The G allele is suboptimal. So we would have thought AAs are the best, GGs are the worst, quote unquote. And AGs are in the middle. Actually, it turns out the AG may even be less optimal than the GG. Oh. Just like that. Just like that. So I'm not good at that. <laughs> so I've got the bad one of that too. So, so now the reason here that Lisa is hinting at and, and obviously bringing it again so beautifully and as an open book to her amazing audience is, well, you know, Lisa, when we just spoke about detox, we're, we spoke of detox, obviously, in the context of the liver, the major detox organ of the body. But really, you really want all of your cells, mind you, to have some ability for detoxification, which is generally the case. 
But, you know, if you were designing the human body, and you were the great Lord, the great whatever, and you're going to design the human body, and you're going to say, well, I'm going to design this human being, and then I'm going to put him or her in a world that's going to have a whole bunch of, you know, stresses and toxic exposures, there are certain portals of entry into the human body. What are the three major portals of entry into the human body? The skin, that's mm -hmm. a major portal. We don't think of it that way, but lots and lots get through the skin into the body. However, it's designed to be protective. The other two major portals of entry are the mm -hmm. respiratory tract, mm -hmm. nasal, sinal, bronchial lungs. That's, you get things into the body. What you breathe in gets into your body. And then, of course, the GI tract. So these are the mm -hmm. two major portals of entry. Well, what's the point of this? You, you want your detox mechanism super active at your portals of entry. You want to have these neutralizing genes producing their neutralizing enzymes active, not just in the liver, but active along the linings of the portals of entry into the body so, mm -hmm. as, to, so as to neutralize the bloody toxins before they get into the body in the first place. Okay. Well, the GSTP one, one of the GST members, they're, they're different members of the family. And notice that when a job in the body is so ridiculously important, oftentimes you will have backup mechanisms. Yep. So the GST genes, they're all making GST enzymes, which are all doing essentially the same job, but we've got slightly different versions of them working in different places in the body. Well, the GSTP one is particularly active in the respiratory tract. And what did we find out that Lisa's GSTP one isn't the Not most good. effective? So that when Lisa breathes in things that are inflammatory. Now, by the way, Lisa, we spoke about those 9P2 ones as the contributing to the, the resilience of the lining of the blood vessels. Well, more and more research, certainly in the thousands of pa patients that we study, suggests that the 9P2 ones not only contribute to the resilience of the blood vessel lining, but also to the resilience of the linings period, oh. the lining of the lung, the uterine lining, oh. all seem to draw its codification of resilience from the 9P. So with Lisa, we've got a uh, alveoli, the lining of her lungs, respiratory bronchial alveoli, that is less resilient, and she's not detoxifying, neutralizing things that she breathes in that may be inflammatory. We've just set the stage there for Lisa to be precisely what? At an increased risk of being asthmatic. Right. Ectopic type asthmas. Do you see how that comes together? Yep. Does it also affect the lining of the stomach? Yes, but... So absolutely. So the GSTP one and having a suboptimal GSTP one and GS, actually all of the GSTs, yeah. having suboptimal glutathione transferase activity is radically important and strongly correlated to increased risk of irritable bowel disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis. Wow. Absolutely. Because again... The We're not detoxifying as efficiently and also increasing the risk, the 9P2 ones, to your point. Wow. Okay? But the reason here that I noticed that there's a little caveat, there is a factor that contributes to the lining. This is what is called the gastrointestinal barrier function. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important things that dictates the health of the lining of your gastrointestinal tract, i.e. the GI barrier function, is not you. It's your microbiome. Okay. Yeah. So in other words, whereas we don't have the equivalent to depend upon for the... We do have a microbiome, by the way, in the lungs. We do, but it doesn't yeah. have the yeah. same as... Uh, symbiotic relationship in contributing to enzymatic function and barrier function as the GI tract. So a healthy GI microbiome can camouflage and can, um, can, 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 can approximate, can reduce the, the negative the 
suboptimal effects of these genes. Of the GST and the 9P21. Oh, okay. So I need to be particularly careful of having a good microbiome as well. However, now notice the little bit of the yin yang here. A healthy microbiome requires the soil, you know, you said toxic soil does mm. not produce healthy product. Well, mm. the health of the environment within which the microbiome grows is dictated by the toxicity or lack thereof in the vicinity, in the environment that the microbiome is going to grow. So having poor GST function sets the stage for potential toxicity at the GI tract interface, the barrier function interface, that could be, you know, setting the tone for unhealthy mm -hmm. But you can really work, so the point here is work to avoid the toxic intake in the first place. Mm. Work to improve your detoxification in the second place. And all along, work to ensure that you are keeping a healthy microbiome. Wow. I know that we've gone on quite a bit. And for the <laughs> audience out there, look what we've done here. Had we, have we spoken about gene A, this result equals this? Gene B, this result? We've not done that, have we? No. What we've done is we've taken systems in the body. We understood what the systems do. We understood how the systems spoke to each other. Then we read the operating manual. Then we looked at the genes that contributes to those systems. Then we interpreted how it all comes together. And the truth of the matter is we've only just begun. We've yeah. just a sprinkling of Lisa's genes. Yeah. <laughs> we do in regards to understanding big picture items in Lisa's health. We didn't even get to the methylation or the hormones or any of those other things. So, I mean, this is, this is a very deep subject and um, I'm actually just starting to realize because I've read my report, I understand, you know, the 101 of, of uh, after having listened to some of your lectures, Dr. Mansour, um, of, of my genes. Uh, now I'm even uh, going to have to be more preventative in my approach. I understand it a little, little bit deeper now. Um, and this has been a fascinating insight, and we've only really t covered a couple of things. I mean, the DNA reports, people, they cover uh, your methylation, your mood and behavior, your hormone health, your cardiovascular health, and we've only touched on a couple of the things here. Um, so if you are interested in getting one of these reports, uh, you can reach out to me or, or to Dr. Mansour through his company, the thednacompany.com. Um, I am going to be starting the course with Dr. Mansour so that I can offer this uh, as part of the, our uh, programs that we do at, uh, with our company. Um, but uh, in the first instance, I think, you know, understanding functional genomics and the importance of, of the pathway. So be careful of those genetic reports that just give you a one and done type of approach. You have this, therefore that. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated than that, and Dr. Mansour is a real, real expert on that. Dr. Mansour, is there anything else that jumps out at you as a, as a final word before we um, wrap this up? Because we honestly, we, I think we, we talk for days if we, could, if we had the time. <laughs> is there anything else that jumps out at you um, in my reports that would be of huge concern or anything? Well, not so much that it's a huge concern, but it's one of the things that I wanted to, because you have opened your book to your community. I don't think anyone, Lisa, and really audience out there, I've spoken to Lisa, well, we've had this as I think our third sitting together. Yep. yep. A few emails here and there, but I remember from the very, I, I must admit that I'm biased and I'm not trying to pander myself to the New Zealand population or any population. I have some of the dearest, dearest, dearest individuals in my life. One in particular is from New Zealand. So I, I am, <laughs> I'm biased. You're like a Kiwi. You know, when you, when you <laughs> someone that's just so wholesome. So I must admit that I was biased. When I met Lisa, confirmed, and I told my wife, I said, you know, just, my God, are they all like this? And, <laughs> you know, because she, anyone, and so to the audience out there, I think we all realize that we have been blessed to have met and to be in the sphere of Lisa. My voice, please wow. forgive me. So one of the things you've seen about Lisa is when she gets her teeth in something, 
oh boy, she's not going to let go. And Lisa's drive and passion that obviously the first part of her life as a performance, uh, ultra athlete. And this comes back to something that is extremely important in Lisa's genetic makeup <clears throat> as it relates to her dopamine. You see, dopamine, i.e. that pleasure neurochemical that when we do something pleasurable, you know, we, whether it's seen on tasting that strawberry cheesecake, not recommending it, but you know, you know, what I mean? <laughs> that, that we, we feel pleasure in life. Well, in order to actually experience that pleasure in order that, okay, you do something pleasurable, that's one thing, but in order to actually feel the satiation the, of, of the pleasure response, you have to be able to bind the dopamine in a special part of your brain known as the nucleus accumbens in the prefrontal cortex. It's the seat of pleasure in the brain. Well, it turns out that Lisa produces very low levels of the <laughs> dopamine receptor. I did laugh when I saw that. <laughs> For all of you out there, if you ever want to know, point being, Lisa is not a young woman by halves. Lisa will never do anything by halves. <laughs> no. Why? Because she has to do, and the truth of it, let's just, you know, if Lisa had not found her passion in performance, her, her passion in helping the world, Lisa has the wiring that she could have become addicted Absolutely. or she could have had to pursue things. Because the point here is Lisa needs to do more than the average person to get that sense of fulfillment. Yeah. And it's, it's a double play that she has to do more to feel that fulfillment, but then because of that, because as human beings, we want to feel fulfilled, she would not ever stop at halves. And that's the, what I wanted to, you, you asked, is there anything I wanted to end with? I wanted to end with something on a completely different light that for your audience, again, a beautiful part of functional genomics, that they can see the person behind the person, that Lisa because she has this very strong genetic phenomena that she quite literally, if we went into Lisa's prefrontal cortex and the nucleus accumbens and we did a stain of her postsynaptic neurons, we're going to see very sparse dopamine receptors. She mm. does not have a lot of dopamine docking stations. Mm. So Lisa is going to have to do more. She's going to have to, in order to not fall prey to not getting enough dopamine stimulation, she could either become addicted to things that would be against yeah. her, i.e. at her disadvantage, yeah. or she could be in the gray zone of not feeling stimulated in life. Two options. The third option, which is Lisa, is not the first two, that she puts her heart, her soul, her passion into doing everything that she does. And thankfully for us, she's <laughs> doing noble <global> things. <laughs> That is so, in other words, I have uh, very poor dopamine receptors, I am constantly chasing reward, that could turn into addictive behaviours, in my case it's turned into um, lots of missions in life, and my <laughs> brothers will laugh at that one because they, they keep saying to me, why are you always on a mission? <laughs> and I said, well, how do you tell a table not to be flat? That's just who I am. <laughs> so, now I have a reason and I can go to them and say, we well, see it's, it's my DRD2 receptor uh, gene. Say, Listen, buddy, I'm feeding my DRD2s right now. <laughs> Do not stand between me and feeding my DRD2s. That's, that's a life story. Do not stand between someone and their DRD2 and their mission. Ever. That's, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. Dr. Mansour, thank you so much for these insights, for the work you do, for the passion that you bring. And this is why I think we get on so well. Is I, um, um, I think you might, you might have the same gene there. I'm not sure on that one. But yes, you definitely bring passion and, and humanity, humanity to the science, if that makes sense. You, may, you bring compassion to the whole science. And that is what's important, I think. Um, in, in the work that you do. So thank you, Dr. Mansour. And I hope we'll have you back again uh, in the future to maybe we do with the other half. So thank uh, you, Dr. Mansour. Honor, and I do, I will end by apologizing. I know Lisa wanted me to cover even more of the genes. I just felt that it would be a disservice to cover the genetics superficially as opposed to take even fewer genes, which is what we did today, but just just to open that, open up to show you, this is what really needs to happen. 
Yeah. So you can really get the fruition of your genetics. It's wow. not one of those things you get a little high for two days. You go, your genetic makeup is a huge part of you. It's not a fatalistic part of you, as you've seen, but it is a huge part of you. It requires some commitment. It requires, it, it demands that we should treat it with a degree of respect. And I hope that I've imparted some of what can happen when you become more mature in your approach to genetics. Lisa, you, you had me from the first time I met you. <laughs> if there's anything I can do for you, it would be an honor. And thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mansour. You are epic. <laughs> okay, I'll stop the recording. Thank you so much. That was just so wonderful. And um, yes, uh, that, that uh, explains a lot of my problems, that DRD2 receptor. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's not my fault. Dr. Mansour, I won't take up any more of your time. I know that we've gone way, way over, but um, thanks for the, the conversation prior to this as well and, and for helping me with that. I would really, really I'll appreciate it. my three action items right now. Awesome. Awesome, Dr. Mansour. And I'm going to sign up for the course and start doing that as well. So very excited. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks, Dr. Mansour. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.